Good afternoon. I'm Kim Tiha, Director of the Pennington Public Library, and I would like to welcome you to the Pennington Schools Wesley Forum for an afternoon of local history. You know, today actually marks our return to this lovely venue. The last time we were here, I had to look it up, was in 2019 for a talk about Honey Hollow with Richard Hunter. So I am so pleased that we're making a return today and that you're joining me. I would like to thank the Hopewell Valley Historical Society and the Hopewell Museum for co-sponsoring this program with us, the Pennington School for their hospitality, and special thanks to Ken Coakley and Doug Dixon for helping making the online portion of this program possible. Hello viewers from home. I believe that we have right now around 20 or 30 viewers from home. Quick reminder, if you haven't already done so, to please turn off your electronic devices. Uh, the restrooms are down the hall, out through the doors. And also please hold your questions for the Q&A until the end of the talk. Now I would like to introduce Bob Wardsnack, representing the Hopewell Museum and the Hopewell Valley Historical Society. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Kim. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I serve as the first vice president on the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, and I'm also a trustee with the Hopewell Museum. One of my main responsibilities is serving on our joint, pro uh, joint program committee, and that's under the leadership of Bob Wallace. Um, we're thrilled to be able to offer these programs free to the public. Please be sure to check out the Hopewell Valley Historical Society's website at www.hopewellvalleyhistory.org and the Hopewell Museum's website at thehopewellmuseum.org. And that way you'll be able to keep up to date with all the monthly programs that we offer. Um, you can also pick up this flyer at the back table that has our the Hopewell Valley Historical Society's website on it. Um, you, we also welcome you to uh, make an online donation to either organization or in person today, if you are so inclined. We welcome you to uh, also join the Hopewell Valley Historical Society for an annual membership and to receive a year-long subscription of our well-researched newsletters. Um, and I would also like to let you know that the museum is in the preliminary stages of our renovation project. We look forward to being able to bring people back into the museum for tours, and we thank you for your patience. And we will remain open for research in the meantime. Uh, today, I'm, I'm very pleased to once again partner with our friends at the Pennington Library, and um, I look forward to hearing uh, Jack Heppel and Jordan Antebi's program today. Um, um, I'm sure you're all very interested to hear about Margaret O'Connell. That was a book that was an important part of our telling the story about the history of Pennington and has served as an inspiration to many of us that wanted to learn more about our shared history. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Bob. I would now like to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. Jack Keppel is a lifelong Pennington resident with a passion for preservation. In the 1980s, Mr. Keppel developed an interest in local history and began uncovering dozens of old photographs and other historical artifacts pertaining to Hopewell Valley's past. While serving as trustee of the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, he, along with other dedicated members, established a permanent collection dedicated to preserving these items. Mr. Keppel also contributed to the publication of the second edition of the Pennington Profile, especially creating the fourth set of photographs that were added to that edition. Mr. Keppel served as president of the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, Pennington Business Association, and was trustee of the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space and Howe Living History Farm. Mr. Keppel has three grown children and lives in Pennington with his wife. And to my left, a lifelong Pennington resident, Jordan Antebi, received his AB degree in history from Princeton University. His undergraduate thesis was a recipient of the Paul A. Stellhorn New Jersey History Award and the C.O. Jolene Prize in American History, as well as the Dean Hank Dobin Prize in Community-Based Scholarship. 
As a high school student, he also worked with Hopewell Valley educators to develop a local history curriculum supplement for public schools. Currently, Jordan serves as a volunteer trustee of the Lawrence Hopewell Trail and is a lifetime member of the Hopewell Valley Historical Society. Join me in welcoming both Jack Keppel and Jordan and Tebby. Well, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. I'm glad that it's cold and windy and not worth doing anything in the outside. And it's some of the today. I also would like to thank the Pennington Public Library for asking us and for making all the arrangements so that we could be in this wonderful facility and also to the Pennington School for making this magnificent space available to us today. This book, The Pennington Profile, changed my life. I can't say that about many other books, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Um, but I think you're going to enjoy this program. And one thing that I can say that I have learned through this experience of working with Jordan, that you can, in fact, teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> So this endeavor is the product of what some might say is an unusual friendship. I met Jordan here at Pennington Day, and he was in third or maybe fourth grade. It was a while ago. And he showed an unusual interest in the historical photographs that the historical society had on display that day. And he lingered longer than many asking me questions and pointed questions, questions that let me believe that this young man was actually thinking about it. A short time later, I noticed him off to the side, sitting down with my mother. And they were talking and talking, and he was asking questions. My mother was grinning and smiling, talking back. And just they just had this animated conversation going on. And shortly, Jordan came back to me and he said, wow, he said, you should talk to her. <laughs> you should talk to her. She knows all about her. Not realizing, of course, it was my mother. <laughs> and so here we are decades later, uh, and this uh, friendship has produced what I think is really an interesting and insightful program. So I'll turn that over to my young friend here. Thanks, Jack. Wow. How do you follow up with that? <laughs> um, as Jack just said, we've known each other for a long time. And this topic that we're presenting today is very uh, near and dear to both of us. And so we hope that you enjoy this presentation as much as we enjoyed putting it together. So I would also just like to thank the Pennington Public Library, the Pennington School the Hopewell Valley Historical Society and the Hopewell Museum for making this program happen. And I also wanna thank the audience, uh, both you all in person and those who are tuned in virtual uh, for your interest in Mar Margaret O'Connell's story as an educator, author, and historian, especially now during Women's History Month. So before, Jack and I jump in. We just wanted to offer a few more introductory remarks about our subject, Margaret J. O'Connell. So over the years, Pennington Borough has remained a community of people who have had a sense of place and who have worked to enhance it. And one such person that we're talking about today was Margaret J. O'Connell, who taught in the Hopewell Township Schools from 1945 until 1961 and was the district's social study supervisor. Ms. O'Connell helped raise awareness for local history and culture, and she touched an entire generation of Hopewell Valley students. Most famously, she wrote Pennington Profile which is a history of this town, Pennington Borough. She also wrote two other books and was an award-winning educator among her other accomplishments. Although today, the book Pennington Profile generally tends to register recognition 
Unfortunately, many newer residents, um, aside from old timers, would be hard pressed to remember its author or who she was as a person. So this talk that we're giving today aims to help fill that gap. It highlights the life and the legacy of a trailblazer who helped shape today's Hopo Valley community and whose courage in the face of adversity can help inspire others. What this talk doesn't do is it doesn't summarize the entire Pennington profile. We hope that if you haven't read this book already, that you will. Instead, it helps provide details about Ms. O'Connell's life, her work, and her legacy in the public history field. She always said that studying people and human interest helped to make her work uh, to make history live and sparkle. And so we hope that after hearing this talk that you too will be excited and inspired uh, to follow her. So you might ask, who was Margaret J. O'Connell? So Peg O'Connell, as many of her friends called her, was, quote, very serious, almost shy, but was an excellent teacher and made history my most interesting class. One of her students remembers her being, quote, reserved in personality with a somewhat stoic demeanor. But beneath the exterior view, I saw her as a dedicated, kind, and caring teacher. So from an early age, Margaret O'Connell, she found herself drawn to writing for and educating young people. I can't remember when I haven't liked to write, she once said. I always wanted to be a journalist, but instead I became a teacher. She was a lifelong Penningtonian and was a product of the public schools and graduated from Trenton State College in the first class of master's students. And it was there that she wrote her thesis on teaching New Jersey history. Her classroom style included sprinkling almost all of her lessons with historical anecdotes and references. Another of her students recalled that she always made the subject come alive. Why, even in arithmetic class, she would inject bits of history, and you should hear her rattle off the dates. A 1958 news article about her described her as a, quote, versatile woman. It said that outside of regular teaching, she developed an original New Jersey reading program for the Hopewell Valley Schools. She served on Pennington's 250th anniversary committee and wrote and directed several school plays as well as playing piano, organ, and violin. And on top of this, she also taught a graduate course at Trenton State on New Jersey history, which was based on her master's thesis. This became her book, Jersey Story, which was a textbook that was later adopted by K through 12 schools across the state, New Jersey. This picture actually shows her presenting a copy of this book to the president of Trenton State College. At the time she said, there's been so much talk of teaching history in the schools, but not much has been done about it. Our state has so much history connected with it, so I decided to turn my thesis into a book. Ms. O'Connell's rhetorical thesis about teaching New Jersey history and in writing books like Jersey Story and Pennington Profile was that, quote, no locality, regardless of size, is an island. It is influenced by outside forces and even in some cases helps to shape attitudes and patterns of larger entities than itself. So as part of this approach, Margaret O'Connell also worked to organize and help promote historical education programs about Hopewell Valley, as well as New Jersey. This picture, and I apologize for the, the poor quality, um, it shows her as a member of the 250th anniversary committee for Pennington. She's actually pictured in the first row, uh, the first on the right there. And so uh, actually sitting next to her 
is another local historian named Alice Blackwell Lewis. And I believe Jack will talk more about her in a little bit. As part of this anniversary committee, she helped create a slide lecture on the town's history. Besides being involved with the 250th celebration, Margaret O'Connell was also the first woman member of the Trenton Historical Society, and she volunteered for Pennington's Clio Club, which was the first community organization focused on preserving local history. Margaret O'Connell was also a devout Lincoln file, and she supported Civil War education and programming in the schools. She was the first female associate member of the DC Civil War Roundtable, and she described the Gettysburg battlefield as her, quote, favorite stomping grounds. For many Hopewell Valley students, the annual trips that she helped organize there became institutions unto themselves. By the way, she took this photo of a statue in Newark, New Jersey. So it was Margaret O'Connell's own radio and slide presentations about Lincoln that became fodder for another book of hers titled Lincoln Lives. At the time, she said, in order to get the pictures I wanted, I experienced many unusual and sometimes amusing incidents. I was chased by dogs, I fell into brooks, but best of all, I met many interesting people. So in recognition of her activities, both as an educator and an author, Margaret O'Connell received several state and national awards. Among them was a congressional invitation to attend John F. Kennedy's inauguration. And although a snowstorm prevented her from attending in person, that didn't stop her from proudly sharing the invitation with her students. When this picture was taken in the early 60s, Margaret O'Connell was at the peak of her professional and her creative output. But around this time, a health crisis would upend her life. She was diagnosed with an illness, which left her bedridden and unable to continue her teaching. And before getting sick, she had started another book, which was a history of Pennington, and she was determined to finish it. For about the next decade or so, she worked to produce what became a 432 page book with over 300 photographs. A news article at the time reported that, quote, from her bed, she directed research, corresponded with former residents, sorted photographs, read proof, wrote the text, and handled publication details. Margaret O'Connell could count on many close friends and associates for help, including Mrs. John Heidi, Mrs. Everett Shaw, and Mrs. Ralph Williamson. These were just the names as reported in the newspaper, but if anybody here knows more about these women, we would love, and their role in creating Pennington Profile, we would love to hear more about them. This image, which is actually from Ms. O'Connell's personal collection, shows some of the women who were her neighbors on Lanning Avenue where she lived. Love the shoes. Any one of them could have been my grandmother here. Yeah, and we don't know if any of these specific women helped with the preparation of Pennington Profile, but it was a similar support network of women who helped her during this time. And Margaret O'Connell would describe writing Pennington Profile as a lifetime project. She said that I was always gathering facts about the community I have lived in and loved. Much of the information was absorbed unconsciously but much more rolled in as I let it be known that I would tell Pennington's story. Writing this book not only became her effort to finish what she started, but a community effort to support her and to preserve its history. In the Pennington Profile Acknowledgements, Ms. O'Connell, she thanks 100, 117 people 
for in a personal capacity for their support in preparing and writing this book. It was reported that, quote, many residents and former residents com combed cupboards and attics to send her old documents and over 500 photographs, quite a lot. So Jack will talk more about these photographs in a little bit, but I just wanted to provide a small sample that shows the breadth and the depth of the O'Connell photograph collection. This image shows members of the AME, Baptist and Presbyterian faith communities. These images show various neighborhood youths playing baseball, a timeless pastime. 1908, 1963. Do you know any other people, Jack? One, one, one that I'll admit to. This image uh, shows a Memorial Day parade of years gone by, and there were many parades that are covered in the photographs. And there were even images of the Pennington Public Library at its original location in the old borough hall. So for most of the time, while Margaret O'Connell was collecting these images and helping write the book, her friends said that she was in pain, but visits from many of her former students helped to cheer her up. And in a sense, one of her friends said, her love of children, combined with her enthusiasm for history, has enabled her to carry this major opus through to completion. When she finally published Pennington Profile in 1968, Dr. William Aby, who's the namesake for today's AB Drive, and who was Ms. O'Connell's physician, wrote that he admired her tremendous fortitude and persistent effort to share her knowledge and abilities with others. She considers Pennington Profile her legacy to her town and its people, he said, especially to the young whom she can no longer teach. So over the years, Pennington Profile has touched the lives of many readers, both young and old, including both of us, who have been fortunate to find it sitting on library shelves or online or at home. And I think that's part of the story of Pennington Profile as well. Also, I'd like to add that Doc Aby here brought my mother and me into this role. Well, he was a long time lecturer, I'm sure. Many of you will remember Doc Aby. Ready? Okay. Next. So one of the common factors about the Pennington Profile book is Jordan and I both found it endlessly fascinating. We read it many times. And so what we're hoping to do today is not really impart history, but we want to inspire you all to read the book. This is my copy of the book. As you can see, it's a little threadbare. Uh, I lost the covers about 20 years ago. I have post-its in there. I have notes in the indexes for things like that. I, I asked him how he lost the cover and he didn't know. I have them, maybe I don't know, but it just indicates how many times. I gave up that I had read this book eight times. After that, I stopped counting. But another fun thing to do that with the book is to just open it somewhere and just read a couple pages. And so what I wanted to do here is to share my connection to the book and also Jordan may choose to add his commentary to the, to the book. Next. So I wanna take a little time to describe that connection. I first learned about this book when it was given to me by my mother. And during my entire lifetime, my mother would impart to me bits and pieces of our family's history. And that history went back before the revolution. Uh, we had ancestors that were 
signers of the United States Constitution, and also a relative who was the founder of Lennox China. My middle name was Lennox, and it came directly from that family connection. So, okay, next. So this is a photograph of the men's group in 1925 with the Presbyterian Church. And as I was reading, I noticed my grandfather, which is highlighted here in the book, in this group. So that's about the time that my family moved to Pennington. Okay, next. And this was another photograph of the cages at the old, one of the old Pennington post office. And in the caption, I read that the postmaster, uh, of course I knew, but uh, this is my father. So for a short time, he was the postmaster of Pennington. He found the regulations and the rules and so forth a little too much and that employment um, by the US government was really not, he was not suited for. I come from a five generations of self-employed people who created their own businesses. So working for the United States Post Office Department was not something that my father was real keen on. So he shortly resigned. Next. Okay, next. Whoops. Sorry. That's all right. So I wanted to bring this up because <clears throat> I thought it was really important to try to communicate that there's really nothing unique about Pennington other than the people. But the thing that's really important is some of the special people that lived here and the qualities. And for 25 years, I had the great pleasure of giving slide presentations to the third graders at the schools in Pennington and Hopewell. And I enjoyed it immensely sharing with these young kids uh, a little bit about our history. Um, and at the end of the presentations, the teachers would always have as an assignment that the students would write these little things, uh, letters and their comments about the slide presentation and what they thought about Pennington history. So if anyone had a Lauren in the Tollgate Grammar School at any time in history, this may have been inner child's drawing. Uh, next. But what I wanted to instill in these people is I picked this line from her letter to me. It is special to live in a town with so much history. And that's the thing that I was really hoping to impart with these children that, you know, their history was not some far off distance thing, but it could be learned just within their own community. And I still remember uh, showing photographs of buildings that are now serve a different purpose and how the children delighted when they would pass that the next time with their parents. And they would say, oh, did you know that used to be a bar in trouble? That used to be, you know, so it gave them this sort of insight to their own community. And it's a pride of our community that I was hoping to instill in these children. And I hope that they, carry it with them, you know, no matter where they go gone in the world, that, you know, their hometown was kind of a special place. Okay, next. So, it's interesting to note in an ever-changing world where buildings are being torn down, home and added, that Pennington has really changed very little during my lifetime. And, I used to inquire with my mother over the years, how did this change in your life? She came here in 1925 and lived her whole life in the community. And in fact, when we finally placed her in the retirement home, her greatest concern was how would Pennington function without her living here? And I assured her that the town would be home. <laughs> So I read the book many times over, and each read brought new and better understanding of my hometown. I was fascinated in particular with the old photographs and how the face of the town had changed ever so slightly. I loved seeing how the community had changed over the years my family called Pennington home. Next. 
So this is the other day, 1964. This is a Margaret O'Connell's photograph. Many of us in the room probably remember in 1964. And it looked pretty much the same as it did today. Uh, the Rexall sign is gone. Uh, there's no more uh, four galaxies parked out front. Uh, but the stores, the barber shop, uh, the luncheonette, uh, and those things have come and gone, but primarily the same thing. It's a very slow evolution. <clears throat> okay, next. <clears throat> Just one year before, but this one year, in this one year, Margaret O'Connell felt the town change tremendously. And as you can see, just the black and white photograph and the stores, it, it just has an older look to it. This uh, four door 55 Chevy sedan parked too close to the corner is interesting to know. You can almost imagine who that was. <laughs> But the thing that I found really interesting, it's hard to see here a little bit, but the big sign that was painted on the outside of many Pharmacy, we probably all remember that for many years. So let's go back 20 more years to 1940. And here we can see the sign clearly on the side of the building. Sodas, drugs, cleaners, barber shop, 38 Ford sedan. And uh, it's interesting to note also, if you look up here, if you look at the very top, in between those top two windows, you're gonna see a Masonic mm -hmm. symbol. That top floor was uh, where the Masons met for many, many, many years. Um, I had the unique opportunity before that top floor was converted into apartments, which it is today, to go up there and see. And it had been literally left alone for 50 years. And so all the Masonic podiums and their risers and their chairs and symbols were all still there, but it was a little dusty and it's all gone now. I'm really happy to say that I had the chance uh, through Dave Miller to go up there and take a look. And you can see the little signs there princeton that's my favorite yeah i like seeing the, the old towns that don't really show up on the maps now like rosedale and buttsville <laughs> yep. Yep. so let's go back 20 more years. so here we are again and you may notice, I love looking at these old photographs. To me, they're just amazing to see, to look at, to study, to learn how to read. Like if you were to read this photograph, you would notice, well, this is the band, there's the Masonic sign at the top, but there's no door facing Main Street. So that today is Vito's, uh, but in 1922, this building faced Delaware Avenue, and it was a general store, and this was referred to as Blackwell's Corner. You can see the gasoline pump there, and that'll also give you some information about the time period. Uh, telephone pole, electricity is present. And it's also interesting to note this sort of misplaced door on the second floor with a little awning over top and inside you can't see it is it blocked and packed. And so that's where they would load material into the warehouse on the second floor. So it's just interesting. Sometimes with a good uh, exposure, you can even read the signs in the windows. So Prior to the establishment of the railroad, Pennington was isolated from the outside world. Connection to Trenton was limited to a daily stagecoach ride that would take up to two hours to get to Trenton, depending on the weather. But with the arrival of the railroads in the 1870s, everything changed. 
all of a sudden this sleepy little town that had changed very little was connected directly to the outside world. And for the first time, people could be encouraged to move to Penny and have railroad, daily railroad service to New York City uh, and be able to bring their families out into the suburb for uh, clean air and clean water, open space. And so that was a big um, promotion. One of the interesting things here I didn't mention about the sign. Could you just go back one? I just wanted to make this point. So the sign is still there. You just can't see it. We found a photograph that Margaret O'Connell had taken. She was just adamant to catch all these changes at Pennington at the time. And so she was just running around taking photographs. So one photograph shows the brick wall that's there now, halfway up the sign, which is still underneath there. I always think that's an interesting fact to consider that it's not the one, you just can't see it. Okay. So I think one more. No, that was it. Yeah, one okay. So my first real project on local history was back in 1985 when I joined the Historical Society. And as I've often said, my mother was a founding member of the Historical Society. It was 10 years old at the time, but the only thing the Historical Society did was have cold dish suppers. And she would refer to it be constantly as the club. Well, the club was doing this. And I said, mom, it's not a club, it's a historical society. But uh, it was something that just really, uh, caught my interest right around 1985. Um, and the first project, and I'll talk about it in a minute, the first project was to create a calendar of historical photographs for the Historical Society. And when we started to look at that time, we realized that there was no place that preserved all these photographs. So I wondered, well, where were the images that Margaret O'Connell had used in her book? You know, like the actual photographs, the print, the, the thing that the printers used to make the book, where were those? And we searched and searched and we couldn't find them. So it started a process of searching for old photographs that continues still to this very day. We, at the historical site, we still have new photographs old photographs coming in on a regular basis are images we've never seen. They're images we thought we'd never find, and lo and behold, somebody had them all along. So I'll go into that uh, in detail in a little bit, okay? So I included this photograph. I had to, not just to show that Jack owns and drives cool classic cars, <laughs> but also to circle back to Jack's original story about how we met at Pennington Day. So I believe my initial encounter with Jack was actually earlier when he had come to speak to my third grade class about Pennington history. And we were the beneficiaries of the efforts that he was just describing. And so Jack came in his suit jacket, kind of like how he is now, and back then it was a, an actual slide presentation. He had a slide projector with a, a, tr a tray of slides. Real slides. And you know, they turn off the lights and we'd all sit and watch the presentation. But I remember seeing images of places that I recognized and being able to relate to these places uh, in the old photographs. And so for me that, made history more engaging and more relatable. And so as I remember, the Pennington Day connection came about because I recognized him from giving that talk. And so it was from there that he, my mom and I, we struck up a conversation. But it was only after I had unknowingly met his mom, Jean, um, and suggested that he interview her. So. In a sense, um, my story and Jack's story are both extensions of Margaret O'Connell's original vision to use history to help educate 
others in Pennington, especially the young. And so she has over the years helped inspired other young persons to help educate themselves and to study and preserve history. So this is actually a good moment to pivot back to the book and to help unpack some of its educational appeal. So what is exactly inside Pennington Profile and what makes it so educationally appealing? So in writing this book, Pennington Profile, Margaret O'Connell said that one of her main objectives was to create a text that, quote, must first of all be readable for children. She wrote Pennington Profile with a journalist's eye, and she crafted a narrative around human observation and interest. And there were several ways that she did this. The first was her own personal observations about the town and community life. She used oral history, which she collected from fellow Penningtonians. She used secondhand observations from archival sources. And my personal favorite, she used statistical data. So in an era before what we now call big data, she recognized that numbers could help communicate new information about people's lived experiences besides just the stories. So for example, this is something I pulled from the back of the book. It's just some numbers she collected about household income in Pennington, both during the Great Depression and during the Space Age. And you might be able to see how things have changed or not changed. <laughs> so um, other books have been written about Pennington and the Hopewell Valley in the past 50 years, but still Pennington Profile remains the town's go-to history. And so part of the reason I think is that this book is written in, in an accessible style and also it is sourced in an accessible way. But another reason, uh, as Jack has alluded to, is that the book remains relevant because of its human interest and its diverse voices. So Margaret O'Connell wrote about Pennington in a way that portrays local history as a kaleidoscope of characters. And so she highlights throughout the text, many ordinary people who contributed to the community life over the years. As a sample, some of them include her father, Gilbert O'Connell, who owned a general store, Mrs. Hope Labar Roberts, who was a published poet and a Presbyterian church leader, and Cedric Clark, who was the first Penningtonian to join the Peace Corps, uh, a working person, a volunteer, and a young person. So all of these people are the community. And so that was part of her intent in preserving this history is showing who built the community. By the way, all of these photographs are from the O'Connell photograph collection. Now, just as social movements were sweeping the country in the 1960s, O'Connell also channeled her inner journalist and she investigated Pennington with a critical eye. And this I think is also another reason why the book's narrative remains so resilient. Within the text, she highlights issues, relatable issues, um, contemporary issues that we still talk about, like feminism, racism, anti-Semitism, and anti-Catholicism. And although she writes reverently of her hometown, she also shows that its inhabitants are also all too human. The final aspect of the book, which really distinguishes distinguishes it from the others is of course the photographs. And Jack will talk more about that. Thank you. So I call them windows on the past. And if I can refer back to this prop here, you can see that the three 
post-its are the photo sections one, two, and three. That's where I need to go the quickest. So depending on the date, it's like, well, is it two or is it three? It could be three, but it might be one. So it's a constant reference, but it's all about the photographs. Next. So and I, um, what I'm going to tell is a little bit of story about these photographs. Um, and I can say probably with pretty assurance that this is a story that's really never been told in public. So in 1985, when we began our search for old photographs of Oakville Valley for this historical society calendar that I mentioned before, we quickly realized that there was no place to go. There was no place that was a repository for these images. And as I said before, I wondered, well, where's the Margaret O'Connell? Where have they been? And we knew, of course, the Hopewell Museum was collecting items, but our understanding was that they were primarily interested in Hopewell and the surrounding area. And so, but no one was preserving anything anywhere about Pennington and the rest of this valley. Next. <clears throat> This is why I love the photographs. I know the then and now, if you will, it was a hardware store in the 1880s and it was a hardware store up until recently. And I can say, and I'm sure I don't speak alone, I personally miss the Pennington hardware store quite a bit, but it's just wonderful. You can see the windows and the brackets, the overhang. It was all pretty much the same. And I love to find that out. Next. So, and the book really inspired all of these things and our project, go ahead, for the Historical Society. So here she is again. And so we asked around when we were trying to make this calendar, where are these all these photographs? You know, it wasn't that long ago that the book had been published, but no one knew anything. So finally, we asked around, and someone mentioned uh, a connection to photo albums or knowledge of photo albums that they had remembered seeing uh, a couple of decades before. So that little comment led to a visit to St. James Church over on East Delaware Avenue. And when we went there, we made an amazing discovery. There, tucked away in a small closet, way in the back, I found four notebooks with 500 images that Margaret O'Connell had collected, 500 images of this little girl in these four notebooks. It was an amazing discovery. And so we found them. So um, what I learned next, uh, here's one of them. I can't tell you how many times I went over to St. James Church to borrow these. Can I borrow number one or can I borrow number four? I'll just be back shortly and I'll just make some copies. And they're like, sure, go ahead. They were pleased to have someone use these photographs that they thought no one was really interested in as no one had shown an interest before until the Historical Society started this calendar project. So I learned from an acquaintance that after Margaret O'Connell had passed away, that there was a box or some container of some sort that collect that contained all these old photographs that had been collected by her or to her friends to make this book. And so a small committee pasted all of these prints into these four loose leaf albums, not sure of the date of it, uh, into chronological order, and then carefully included mostly handwritten captions underneath. Presumably from notes that Margaret O'Connell had made while she was making the board. So, what happened is the decades passed, notebooks were forgotten, except for just a few of the partitions. Next. Whoops. Maybe you need no. Okay. Anyway, go back. Oh, that is forgive me. So <clears throat> as the village grew, the demand for a bank in town grew. 
trips to Lambertville and all the way to Trenton were the only solution to hiding your money under your mattress, as the saying would go. So this is the former Irving house that was converted into a bank, okay? Same building, new purpose. It's interesting to note the sidewalk is going east on East Delaware Avenue. You can tell that the Irving house has been converted because there are bars on the window. And the first national bank over the top of the dead giveaway that it's now a bank. But it was interesting to note this Irving house had been there for hundreds of years, was there prior to the revolution. And it had been a sort of a meeting place for townspeople to discuss events, to the formation of the Pennington Fire Company took place in the old Irving house. But after 1905, uh, it became a bank. Um, Who are the gentlemen standing there? So the gentleman on the left is Raymond Woolsey, and the gentleman on the right, I'm not sure. But a short time ago, uh, I'm going to say 10 years or so, uh, descendants of Mr. Woolsey donated to the historical site a nice big box of things that he had collected in his notes and papers from all those times. So it was interesting. So what happened next? We kept, and there's, the bank was torn down and this was put in its place, obviously. It's still a beautiful building, it's still a landmark. And I'm happy to announce today, if you were interested in gold bullion, that's where you would go to buy your I went in there and they had stacks gold, everything, everywhere. And that's what the new owner said, it's all about bullion. So, next. So, in 1985, a small group of Hopewell Valley Historical Society's members formed a committee within the Historical Society to officially establish a permanent collection for the first time. Thankfully, at the time, the board of the Hopewell Valley Historical Society established a budget to take care of all these wonderful photographs and even money in case we had to buy something. And I'd like to say my friend Benita Grant here in the back was also one of the founding <clears throat> members of that committee back in 1985. Both of us continue to this day. I think that's 38 years later, some such thing. We're still working at it, but it's a labor of love. Next. <clears throat> this was a, still one of the most amazing discoveries I've ever seen. As the search continued, we found shopping bags filled with material collected by, could you just go back one? Yes. Second? We found shopping bags, literally shopping bags, penny to market shopping bags, books, full of things that this woman had collected over her lifetime, Alice Blackwell Lewis. As a lifelong Pennington resident, she felt that this group of items should stay in Pennington. She was a historian, author, and also curator at the Hopewell Museum, but she felt that these two shopping bags or whatever part should stay in Pennington as there was no place to put them, uh, they also got pushed to the back of the closet. And so we realized that really something had to be done to establish some place to store all of these wonderful photographs. Okay, now i sorry. Before we go on, okay. didn't you say that she had a, a saying about history? Or well, about stories? Yes. When I first started getting involved in 1985, I remembered that Alice uh, was also a family friend. My grandparents, the, they used to play bridge together. There was a family acquaintance. And so someone said, well, you know, I could take you over to meet her if you want. And I was sort of so engrossed with what I was finding in this book that I jumped at the chance. She was 96 years old, a bedridden. Uh, she remembered me as a little, oh, yeah, you're Sarah's kids. And so we talked about history. And uh, she really inspired me to sort of 
carry on the work that she had done. She said, someone really has to do it. And one of the things she told me that I, I thought was interesting, and I still use it to this day. She said, you know, when you're writing on about history, she said, it's like a brick wall and the historical facts are the bricks. But what makes the story interesting and what makes it attractive is the mortar in between. In other words, those are the stories that we tell. Those are our personal interpretations of the facts that we've been given. And it makes history a little bit more interesting. You know, and I used that when I was with the third graders. I was continually amazed. I had three classes of third graders, 60 children sitting on the floor waiting to hear what I had to say. And I thought it's up to me to keep their interest. And I know what I would have liked if it was me, but these children were amazingly uh, interested in what we were teaching them and the things about their community that we we're learning. <clears throat> so next. So one of the most amazing discoveries we made along the way was finding a collection of glass plate negative. They were four by five and they had been put in a wooden box and stacked again in the back of a closet or maybe under the bed. Today, they're known as the Frisbee Family Collection. It contained nearly 800, that's 800 images of Pennington from the time period from 1890 to just about World War II. So it's amazing to look at these collections. We found upon study that they were actually taken by both brothers. George on the right was quite a ways older than his brother Walter on the left, but they both became fascinated in photography. And this was about the time that, you know, you remember photographs of, you know, the, the photographers and they're under the thing and they're like this, and then they run into the wagon. And, you know, that is, uh, wet plate. And so the reason they had to run in there was they only had a short time to develop these photographs before the image was lost. But then Eastman Kodak invented a dry plate. And so the dry plate was a four by five piece of window glass that had a light sensor emulsion put on it. And then you would pull it out and put it into your camera. And this was what allowed amateurs, shall we say, or just normal people to start taking photographs for the first time because it was easy, it wasn't messy, there was no chemicals. And so they both had these large format cameras and together, uh, George was a businessman, or worked at a, ultimately his parents had a business over on South Main Street um, and they worked there and he ended up working for a larger wholesale food company in Trenton. Walter did the same, and he was also the mayor of Pennington. But we still examine these photographs. They've been a part of my life for the last 38 years, and I still love to look them over. I still see things I never saw before. I love things in the back, uh, and it's great to see. Okay. Um, the other, yeah, I was going to just add. The other thing about the Frisbee collection is it the photographs were first published in Pennington Profile. Yeah, right. And they were, were they credited or well, not credited? The first edition, the blue book, which is what I have here, that's the public. The first edition included all of these Frisbee family photographs, but Miss O'Connell did not credit the Frisbee family or, or the Frisbee brothers as the photographers. And so it was an interesting point that um, when we finally were able to convince the family to denote this collection for the historical society, Alice Frisbee, who was in her 90s, I promised her, she said, you know, they were never, our family was never credited. You got to make sure if it's ever a chance comes. So when the second edition came, it was time to reprint it. I said to the library, let me put the name Frisbee underneath the images. So in the red and brown copies, editions of the book, you can see Frisbee photograph underneath. Okay, next. Now, 
you're going to be showing your age if you know what they are and if you know what that is because it's not something that young people have any idea i i do yeah you gave you gave a talk to, to my class with something but like that when i first started i had to have slides made they were four dollars and fifty cents a piece so you can imagine Imagine the show with 50 photographs was pretty cost, but that is what you had to do. Um, so this was another collection which showed up. Um, and Jordan mentioned this before that Miss O'Connell had a slide presentation in the 50s to celebrate an anniversary of Pennington's 250th, and she gave a slideshow. So in our studies recently, I realized for the first time that these are in fact those exact same slides. I wasn't sure over the years. I thought maybe she just gave a slide presentation. This, these were her actual slides. And it's an interesting story. After her death, the neighbor discovered these slides, trays holding nearly 100 slides in a trash can on Lanning Avenue. She had no really family or anyone. So whoever cleaned out the house just threw them out. And the neighbor brought them to me. And he said, I thought you'd probably like to have them. And so they remain. It's an interesting collection. And Jordan and I were just talking about how when the smoke clears from all of this preparation, that we're going to slip down with a slide projector and a slide screen and look at all of Miss O'Connell's slides together for the first time and just to see. A number of them she had uh, actually numbered so you can yep. see what her presentations were like. And it was great. I think some of them were taken by friends who she sent out on missions. Uh, some of the photographs were her own, but it was great because like some of the slides, they were so crude that there was information on the edges that she didn't want to show in her slide presentation. So she took black electrical tape and taped them to, the, to, to crop them out. It's really great. It's a sign of the times. Okay. Next. Sir. So, reading the book and examining the photograph gave me a new connection to my community and its past. Digitization of these images gives us even better insight into reading these photographs. And if you see, this is a Prisby photograph. This is the West Delaware Avenue Bridge. If you cross this, you go to the Pennington Market today. But if you look underneath the bridge, next, this is what you can do with digitization that it couldn't do before. So looking through the bridge, you can see in the back, that's the Pennington train station, some of the outbuildings in the foreground, and what are the Reading Railroad's old Camelback locomotives coming southbound under the bridge? It's just great to look them and examine them. Next. Another Frisbee photograph, one of my favorites. And also reading the book and examining the photographs gave insight into the developments of transportation in small towns all across America. We weren't really that unique, but there were some things that was really a reading of what was going on in the country at the time. Street railway. Let's just go back just a second if you can. So if you look at this photograph, the only thing that you can tell is that today, this building is um, Pennington Pizza. So that building, the big building that's in all the other photographs, that's what that is. This is a street railway that had service to Trenton from first Pennington and then on from Hopewell. And this was the first way that could directly connect the two cities in a, in a way that people could consider moving out of the city, moving into these suburbs. And that's exactly what my grandparents did about 100 years ago. My grandmother would tell the story that in the 20s, she just felt living in Trenton, they lived on the island, some of you may know the island, living on the island, things were a little too rough, too much going on, kids in the street, 
It was just getting too rough and my grandparents both decided we need to get out of the city. And as I mentioned, our family had been in the city of Trenton for hundreds of years, literally, but it was time to move out into the suburbs. So something like a trolley made it possible for my grandparents to start their new family on Welling Avenue. And my grandfather could go to the clinic, step on the trolley and get to work in Trenton in a very short amount of time. So it was huge to connect Pennington to, to Trenton at that time. It's huge. Okay, next. And again, I always love zooming in on these photographs digitally. And this, and it's hard to make out here, but you can see the people crammed in the trolley. And you can imagine them getting ready for this ride to Trenton. And it was loud, and it was hot, and it was crowded. But you can see all of the people sort of in there ready to go. Next. So during my presentations to the third graders over the years, and even to adults, one of the things that fascinated them endlessly was the changes that took place in between the centuries. That is the beginning of the 20th century and everything changed. And then the kids loved hearing about it. So trying to tell the third graders, of course, we've all heard of the third graders, they you just didn't jump in your minivan and drive down to the market real quickly. It was a lot more involved. And there were these huge beasts involved and all of these things that they had to do to get anywhere. And the kids found that fascinating. And this here is a photograph of Margaret O'Connell's mother and father riding in a wedding gown. So this is your basic Surrey with the fringe on top. Mm -hmm. Next. This is another big, big favorite that was part of Margaret O'Connell's collection. Now I've looked at this photograph, I'm gonna say easily for 25, maybe 30 years. I just realized studying and examining this photograph zooming in that this wagon did not have those letters painted on the side of it. That's what I always thought. I think everybody who saw it, that's what they thought, but it's actually not true. When you zoom in, you can see that some crafty photographer took whatever device they have and he actually put those words on the side of the wagon. It looks cool, but it didn't really exist. I could tell in the S because the S went right over the wheel and the period after Pennington went right over the door. So it was clearly not there. I can't imagine someone doing that on the side of a wagon, but it's an interesting photograph. And the kids delighted in imagining themselves in this wagon, took clomping down the dirt roads to get to school every day and back again. But as the schools, there were a lot of country schools. And as they started to close their door, the one room school, it became more important to come independent. So, so there were contracts set to all of these communities, Hoverton, um, Woodsville, Federal City, to bring these children into the schools in these old wagons. This is another favorite. This is, a, again, a Frisbee photograph. And I always put this photograph up for the kids and even the adult. And I love to ask them, do you know, and I'll ask today, who was the first person in most communities that bought an automobile? Does anyone know? Bingo. The doctor was always the first person. This is Dr. Hart's uh, 1908 uh, Model 8. Buick. Buick. I love the photographs. You can see the bulb horn on the side. Uh, you can see the acetylene lamps, two up there, two down there. They, there would actually be an acetylene tank, and they would open the valve and light these like a pilot light at night to drive. Next. So if we zoom in, here's the doctor's wife and daughter in the backseat. And I swear I can detect a look of terror on that young lady's face. You can see she's holding on. There's no, you're right out there, you're bang on. One of the interesting aspects, the features of the glass plate negatives that we talked about before, they're four by five inches. And if anyone has ever tried to blow up a snapshot uh, back in the old days, remember photo map, things like that. If you ever try to blow up a photograph, they usually look lousy because when you blow them up, they look lousy. 
a glass plate negative. This is the only glass medium. You could take this photograph and literally blow it up the size of this wall, and it would still be sharp and crystal clear as it would be when it's four by five. It's amazing. Some of you remember one of the banks down here on the highway that opened up and they had a big giant mural in there of a Pennington Fire Company fire wagon. And that was, we did that the same way. I went to Philadelphia and watched them take this little photograph and blow it up to something that was 20 feet long. It was quite an amazing process. Next. So what I'm telling you here are the stories that I enjoyed reading about people in Pennington at the time. And you could read the story and see the photographs. And this is Charles Hendrickson. If you look closely, you can see in his hand that he has a glass lantern for a street light. So when the Pennington Borough Municipality was created, it was a time when the residents of the borough wanted their own stuff. They didn't want to have to pay for things out in the township roads and fence and so forth. So the first thing they did was put in street lights. And so what they had to do was have a someone to light them, trim the wicks. You can see here's the base of the lantern here. You can see him cleaning it out. He had a little stool there and a little cart that he designed with all his little tools. And every morning and every night he'd wheel this cart and he'd put these lights on and then turn them off. And so he was the official Pennington town lamp player. One of the things that we've heard while researching history was this man's middle name was Heavy Dick. And to this day, I have still not figured out where that nickname come, came from. I'm sort of afraid to ask where he, he was quite a character. And that was the thing that I thought was interesting with Margaret O'Connell telling these stories. And this gentleman was mentioned more. I have a stack of letters from third graders about their watching the slideshow. And most of them mentioned the lamp lighter. They thought it was just fascinating. He was never married. He lived in a little house on Bird Street. But if you go down to the African-American cemetery on South Main Street, his gravestone is there. He was poor, modest, never married. His gravestone is huge. It's like this. So we don't know who paid for that. We have some suspicion, but we really don't know. An interesting man. I'll give you a couple more, and then we'll move on. Next. Charles Lennox claimed to be a retired British Army officer. For many years, he served as the Pennington Memorial Day's Grand Marshal. Once a year, Mr. Lennox would appear in town. Adults and children alike couldn't wait for him to come in. And his striking look while up on his horse, as you can see here, earned him the nickname of Buffalo Bill. And so as a little boy, my mother assured me, oh yeah, Pennington has its very own Buffalo Bill. And I can remember seeing them in the town parade. Next. Another character was Joseph Thompson, and he was a flag crossing guard. And so when the railroad came through, it crossed. The only way to get out of town on Franklin Avenue is a grade crossing. And so as the railroad traffic increased, the Reading Railroad felt that they needed to have an official flag crossing guard. And so Mr. Thompson was appointed the first flag crossing guard. And she tells lots of stories about all the tales that Mr. Thompson would tell as people would congregate around. And it was just interesting to tell. He was the first man, according to Margaret O'Connell, that had the experience of eating a hot dog or a roll and a ice cream. And so he loved to tell the children when he came back that he had experienced these two things, according to Margaret O'Connell. <laughs> Next. Another important part of Margaret O'Connell was to document the effects of World War II and World War I on the community. So this wonderful photograph, we presume she took, shows the service women of the area posing during the town parade. And I showed this photograph once in a woman in the audience, she'll go, hey, that's my aunt on the end. 
So we have the names of all of these people, but that was an important, and also the effect that the World Wars had on the families that stayed there. <laughs> Next. I'll just add another topic that she talks about related to World War II is how there were labor shortages because many of the men who worked were off fighting. So women would step up and work during World War II. And she highlights stories of their service on the home front during World War II. Next, almost done. Next. A few more I wanna show you. So one of the important components of historic preservation has been the establishment of historic districts and communities across the country, across the world. An important, uh, and Pennington's historic crossroads district, which we now have, was a long fought process. It took a long time to get that district in. But one of the important things that historical photographs can be used for in historic preservation is, according to uh, uh, my research on the Frisbee collection, was the brothers documented a lot of houses, a lot of houses in Pennington when they were brand new, or how houses looked at the turn of the 20th century. And as you can see here, if you were an owner of this house, uh, which the current owner chose not to use this photograph, but you could tell exactly how to replace. You can see the detail there, the details in the windows, the banisters, and all of those things. And these glass plate negatives, you can zoom right in on a porch column and see exactly how. It is. And so we've used those a few times over the years. Next. So. Another part that we basically discovered doing this or realized was that in order to make this book, Margaret O'Connell went around Pennington in the 50s and took a lot of photographs. So she, in fact, was documenting the town in that time period, which was really important. And so she herself was a documentary. And so here's a shot down uh, the business district in Pennington, 1963. Uh, you can see uh, the stores here. Some of you may remember, it took me a while to remember, we had actually two hardware stores in front of me. We had Flint's and we had this one around the corner. Barber shop, hot point. So she was documenting how the business district looked. Next, this was another biggie. Some of us remember the excitement that we felt when the Pennington Market built this huge supermarket out on the highway, oh, it was a big deal. And so here's the opening of that Pennington Market. And I swear I can still remember that old lady with her white Cadillac driving around the town. Another one that's fun is next. This is the Pennington Pharmacy. Some of us may remember the old Pennington Pharmacy that is prior to 1963. In that year, it was all changed and modernized and some of us remember that. I remember as a young boy that I figured out at a certain age that it was important to buy Christmas presents. So I would wander up to the Pennington Pharmacy and I could buy everything in my family a little something and the Pennington Pharmacy would give us a gift. Most of them were insignificant, but it was thought that mattered. Next one, I'm gonna finish with this photograph. This was not in the book. This was part of Margaret O'Connor's collection. And I love to look at this photograph and I ask you all now, can anyone here tell me where this is? There's one clue, one clue in the back. I love it. I had to, I put this in yesterday. I said to Jordan, I don't care. It's not a book. I got to show it. Okay, next. Here it is. Ready? Oh, Isn't that cool? I just love it. So, when the state decided to bypass Pennington Borough and create this new highway with this crazy traffic circle. The highway went around Pennington and that photograph before was one that documented this brand new highway in the mid thirties. And so I always love, and I might add, I think I took my life into my hands trying to take this photograph. And I tried to walk into the middle as the other one, but I just well, I wasn't feeling that daring. So I ran quickly and snapped and ran out of the way. But it, it's just fun to look at these changes in old photographs. 
So today, Jordan and I are thrilled to shed some light on Margaret O'Connell's accomplishments. And 50 years later, we salute all her efforts in saving our past for future generations. Thank you. I would be happy to take some questions. I'll do the best to answer them if anyone has any questions. It's fine. I know I covered everything thoroughly, but I'm happy to, to I've left you all speeches, which is great. Yes, in the back. Sure, I would just like to add, not in a question, but just a comment that we bought the O'Connell's house huh? in an estate sale, 1984. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's interesting. So that dates when I got the slide. Thank you. And I've been told that many a hand went into one of the bedrooms that had uh, quite a few articles in it because the house was easily accessible. The back door just opened up and in you went and off they went. Out. Well, I can say that we are very thankful for uh, St. James Church and their parishioners. Uh, they were the owners and caretakers of these four wonderful notebooks of old photographs up until a year ago. And we were pleased to have them um, donate her collection, 500 photographs to the Hope of Valley Historical Society. And we just love having them. Any other questions? I thought I saw another hand in the back. No? Well, yes, yes, sir. Were these by any fans related to the inventor and fly object? Spelled differently. No. That would, that would have been cool to attach to this collection, but no. Yes, Kim? Yes, we have a question from uh, the virtual attendee about uh, Margaret O'Connell. About uh, what was her diagnosis of her chronic medical issue? Jordan, do we know? We don't know, and we don't feel it's appropriate to speculate. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We do know that she overcame a lot of obstacles to make this book happen. And I can say for myself that I'm glad she did. Yeah. Does anybody know how Pennington got its name? Well, yes. Um, there are stories. In the book. In the book and elsewhere. Uh, there's a big rock in the center of town in front of the uh, Bullion Center uh, that talks about the original name was Queenstown. Uh, now, that story has been disputed a little bit. But it made sense to me because in colonial times, you had three new broad communities. You had Princetown, you had Kingstown. So why not have a Queenstown? But as it turned out over the years, Pennington was a stop off place for travelers on their way from Trenton to points north. And the story was that they could stay, find lodgings in this community for a penny a night. So it was Penny Town. That's the and we recommend uh, reading Pennington Profile if you haven't already, because all these stories of how Pennington came to be and why it is called Pennington are described very thoroughly in the book. Yeah. Did we mention that? Book? Yeah, I guess we did. You can find copies of the Pennington Profile at the Pennington Public Library and also online and also at other local libraries. Yes, Jordan, I have a flyer in the back uh, as recently as 2022. Uh, thank you to uh, Doug Dixon. Uh, we have digitized the Pennington profile. So the flyers in the back have a link where you can go to do this online. And it's also searchable, right, Doug? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Not a, um, not a question, but a comment. Um, my name is Rick and I'm an engagement file with the uh, library and the Pennington Library. Sure. We ran out of copies of Pennington yeah. Profile, yeah. and just about that time, this gentleman came in the back row with a big, dusty box of books. In it, Margaret O'Connell had just died. This is her legacy of Pennington Library. There was only one copy of Pennington Profile, but there was Lincoln Lives and the and the other one that we wrote about George Washington. So we uh, said, I said to the, the lawyer, I said, 
we don't have any more copies of the title. What can we do to get the copyright? He says, Oh, I'll write you a, a, a permission. So about a week later, we got very official letter saying you have permission to be printed. So Tim Stagg, who was the librarian at the time, and I contacted a couple of local printers and we went up to the end of the world up someplace in North Jersey, gave them a copy of the the uh kind of the profile, and they put together a new edition of it, along with some extra photographs that we got from the historic society. We have uh, oh yeah, the board said we can do it as long as we do cost them any money. So we did that. We know basically a subscription to the uh uh book for the first 20 people got these nice leather found copies and the rest of them were red copies. So I see that see somebody couple people don't have the old one. Does anybody have the new one? Yeah, yeah, I don't think there are any more left, but now you can get it uh, to go watch it on your computers. But anyhow, these two copies to go to the historic side for whatever they want to do with it. I appreciate it. Okay. We Thank really you. appreciate that. Thank you so much. So if there are no more questions, um We'll end here, and I want to thank you all for being a great audience. And it was really a pleasure for Drew and I to work on this. We learned so much about the book just in the last few months. So thank you again.